Hello and welcome to Literary Merit, the show where we tell you what media has value. Spoiler alert, it's all of it. Also, spoiler alert, we'll be discussing spoilers as usual, so here's your warning. I'm Ashley. And I'm Alex. And I want to welcome you to our 20th episode, Alex! Oh my god, I knew it was coming, but I totally forgot. (laughs) (laughs) Well, what have you been up to on this auspicious day? Today I've done literally nothing, I've sat in bed, um... (laughs) And, oh, I did a little painting, though. I've been doing some painting. Um, Yeah, it's cool that you've been keeping that up. Yeah, well, there was a call for submissions for some uh, erasure poetry. So I've been trying to do some, like, painting erasures, and that's kind of keeping me, my mind stimulated right now. Cool. Other than that... Is that uh, mostly what you've been up to? (laughs) Well, today, yeah. But I also have, like, a clutter of things around me, like, that are, like little notes about what I did this week. (laughs) So I've got a stack of books from when I went to Powell's on Friday. I'm so jealous. And then I've got the Blu-ray case for King Arthur. (laughs) (laughs) I'll definitely need to hear some about that. And then I've got um, my new my new glasses from Zenny Optical. They look rad. Isn't Zenny Optical the best? Uh yeah, because these glasses, like, I don't, no adjustments were needed, which is so rare. They're so good. I love my Zenny Optical glasses. Like, we're not sponsored, but, yo, Zenny Optical, <laughs> if you want to sponsor a podcast. <laughs> well, with, like, okay, so I've done Warby Parker and I've done Zenny. Um, Warby's good because you get, like, the they, they send you the options and you get to try them on and, like, ask your friends which one looks best on me. Um, yeah, it's a little fancier. Yeah, and it's, I mean, and their price is really good too. Like a hundred dollars for for all of it. That's really good for glasses. Yeah, especially compared to like a anywhere, even you know, Costco regular like, frames. Costco a hundred dollars yeah, exactly. is the minimum you will pay, and that's just for the glasses themselves, not for like the exam and all that. Mm-hmm. However, from Zenny, I got these super rad glasses, lenses and all, for like sixty dollars. Oh, I, I I can up one up you on that one. I got <laughs> I got um, the ones with the little red um, frames on the sides. Yeah, those are so. They come cute. in three colors, uh, the primary colors, um, and <laughs> they actually there was a, a guest at work who had the yellow ones, and I was like. I was like, I have to stop him and actually ask, even though that seems really uncomfortable to me. I was like, I need to know where he got his glasses. And he told me, <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, I'm obsessed. Um, but they were $7. Mm-hmm. Oh my God. And then I added... For, That's as cheap as they come there. Yeah. I, they might have been a little bit, but they might have been 8 But the cheapest ones they have are six ninety five, And they're not they're not mm-hmm. the most hideous things. You, you'd think they would be, but they're not. Um, they're totally suitable yeah. and like if you only have for, a little bit of money for glasses yeah. like, and then for three extra dollars I got clip on sunglasses for those ones nice. and then those big round pink ones I designed those I picked the, the style of the wire I picked the color of the wire frame and I picked the color of the lenses um, and those were like $34 for prescription sunglasses I know I've been actually I was thinking of getting some prescription sunglasses and then I found these super cool ones that are like prescription glasses that have a sunglass that like magnets onto the front yeah. and I was like oh I'm covered I don't even have to yeah. worry yeah I, I I've, I've, I've dealt my whole life well not my whole life I've only had glasses since high school but like mm-hmm. trying to look not ridiculous putting glasses sunglasses on top of my glasses Get those, like, big old person huge ones that, like, fit over. Yeah, I mean, (laughs) so I'm just so glad to find an affordable, like, somewhat stylish. I mean, they have some goofy styles, too, but, like, it's a pretty stylish. They just got everything. Did you see those weirdo, like, asymmetrical ones where, like, one eye is, like, an octagon and the other is, like, a triangle or something? they're the weirdest things i've ever seen i don't know who would want those like they're kind of funny as like a funny look at my weird costume accessory but these are prescription glasses that you can buy and wear every day of your life well okay i don't know the pink ones that i got like 
a year ago or before that, I would have been like, these are so strange. I would I would never wear these. And then now I'm like, these are amazing. I want to wear them all the time. You yeah, know? go for it, man. They look great on you. Although when I take them off, everything's completely green. <laughs> oh, like your eyes adjust to the pinkness. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> what have you been up to? I have been so busy. Oh my God, my life. Um, cause I'm rehearsing for this Christmas show uh-huh. and it's really fun. It's, it's really a great time. These kids are super talented. It's at, um, Will, one of the schools that Will works at, the dance school he works at, um, they do this Christmas show every year and his boss roped me into playing one of the roles. Um, I'm getting paid, so that's pretty great, Ooh. but, um, it's just like, I, I agreed to do it because I was like, getting paid? All right, whatever you say if you want to give me money. But then I thought about it and I was like, oh, that time is actually more valuable <laughs> to me than the money is right now because I'm so busy because I'm working on that audiobook and I have to finish it um, by the middle of January. And and I've still got a lot to do. It's going well, but it's just very hard to find time when I can record when the house is quiet. Because, yeah. like, for the podcast, if there's some Netflix in the background or a dog barks or whatever, it's fine. Like, it, nobody Yeah, we're cares. not getting paid for this. But, <laughs> <laughs> and we're not getting paid, and it's like, it's a podcast. What do you want? We don't need, like, professional quality here, but, like, for the audiobook, it's really very important that the audio not be, like, tainted by anything. So it's been a challenge to find opportunities to record that. But, um, fun things, though, that I've been doing, I went and saw Coco on Friday, the new Pixar movie. I've heard amazing things. I've heard amazing things. My face was wet. Oh my gosh. (laughs) It was so good. It was so sweet and wonderful. And the music in it is so good. It's so cute and so good. Uh, I mean, like, it's one of those ones with the big twist that you can see from like a thousand leagues away if you're, you know, an adult. <laughs> but it doesn't matter because it's still just so wonderful and sweet. Yeah, I really recommend it. It's 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 a lot of fun. Well, it's so funny because my worry was that it's going to be too similar to the Book of Life. But literally everyone that's seen it has not even mentioned any similarities. So I'm like, oh, never mind then. <laughs> I actually haven't seen Book of Life, which is crazy because I'm, like, all about cartoons. But, yeah, like, it's it's also sort of about, like, the Mexican idea of the afterlife. But I think beyond that, like, there's really no similarity um, between the two. It's, oh, mm-hmm. man. Like, everyone, the little boy who plays the main character is so good and so cute. It's very fun. <laughs> Yeah, definitely recommend. It's Pixar, though. Like, obviously, go see it. It's Pixar. (laughs) But and I've also been watching this great new series on Amazon called um, The Marvelous Mrs. Meisel. Oh, I've never heard of that. Oh, my gosh. So it's it was created by the guy who created the Gilmore Girls. (gasps) And it's so good. It's about this, like housewife in uh, Manhattan in the late 50s whose husband leaves her and she decides she's going to be a stand-up comedian. Oh, that sounds amazing. It is amazing. The woman who plays Midge, the main character, she is the most charming person on this earth. She's so good and so funny and so lovable. It's really good. I'm going to have to Write that down, because sounds like my mom and I could watch that together. Definitely. Warning, um, content. It's an Amazon Prime original, um, so it's got grown-up things in it. But it's well, a really I, sweet, can, fun my comedy. My mom can usually handle the grown-up things. I mean, yeah, it's just like there's swearing and occasional boob. <laughs> my <laughs> so. mom used to watch walking dead so i think she can handle it oh yeah she's gonna be fine it's just like you know it's about like um one of the characters actually it's really great is um lenny bruce the uh sort of original shock comic Mm -hmm. uh sort of the 
ancestor of guys like George Carlin. And uh, so he he's on there, and you know, so there's like crude language and stuff, but it's mostly just about this woman trying to find a way to like deal with her life sort of turning upside down. I have to tell you about uh, a documentary I watched just today because it was so like oh what was it um i forget the title but it's like um jim and andy and with like a uh mandatory mention of this other guy so it's um jim carrey talking about his performance in the movie oh, about andy kaufman. as andy kaufman yeah. and it's yeah and it's i have heard of tons that tons of behind the scenes footage of the filming that they were not allowed to release before because they thought because um Universal thought that it would make people hate Jim Carrey. And they were like, he's making us so much money because he's this lovable guy, we can't release it. But now he's like... Interesting. Now he's not interested in being that person anymore, so he's like, let's do this. Not at all. He's a weirdo now. (laughs) And like, he's so freaking smart. I'm like, obsessed with... Like... His whole trajectory of his career. Um, because we, I mean, who doesn't love him? Uh, he's, I mean, he's made some really great stuff. He's done amazing work. Yeah, and it, it, He's definitely um, doing some, having a weird sort of well, thing right now. And he right talks now, about it in the documentary. Attitude he, and... it's, it's basically um, clips of when they were filming that movie interspliced with him talking about it now. Um, but it's also a lot really? of him talking about, like, he's not interested in trying to be this person that everybody likes anymore. He's only interested in exploring, mm. I don't even know. He's, like, so, he's, like, up there with Jaden Smith, like. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's clear, he's got some kind of, like, serious rejection of the machine going on right yeah, now. Yeah, but he's not, like. And he's just. Trying to be like but a it's crazy not even hermit. Like that. It's just like so. He's so peaceful. It's so mind blowing. I don't know. Did you see that weird oh, that, rant yeah. at New York Fashion Week? Yeah, but that's also like that was pretty rude. Yeah, but that's also <laughs> he doesn't have to pretend anymore, so he's not going to. You know. Sure. No. I'm. T- but like that was a stunt. Oh, like he didn't have to go there. True. Like he went there on purpose <laughs> and said some mean stuff on purpose. Like that's. <laughs> You know, he, I don't think he was explicitly invited to New York Fashion Week. <laughs> I, you, but, but maybe he was, you know, maybe he just constantly gets all maybe. these invitations, even though he's not even out there anymore. And he's just like, you know what? I'm tired of it. Let's burn a bridge so that I don't have to deal with it anymore. Yeah. Well, because I think it, like it, part of the whole speech he gave was like i try i tried to think of the most vapid thing i could do so i came here yeah. <laughs> <laughs> jesus come on jim <laughs> it's a perfectly reasonable industry calm down <laughs> um but that was that was really interesting and by the end you're, you're not like devastated with like with some documentaries you're just like oh that was so interesting and it like i i've never mm. i didn't i basically knew nothing about andy kaufman before today so fascinating dude well then jim carrey's like portrayal of him is like like think method actor and then think like 10 steps beyond that well it's the only way to play andy kaufman like that's that's what that man demands yeah. i well, think and then of course like one of andy's characters too is mm-hmm. like this horrible man that everybody hates and he's so mean and some days Jim just showed up as him, even if he wasn't <laughs> filming as him. And he would, and he yeah. would like, I don't know. It was, it's so fascinating, and like, you know, it's all intentional, but it, at the same time, you're like, I don't know if he's controlling it, you know? Yeah. What? Yeah. It's what's going on in there. Exactly. Yeah. Oh. Speaking of, like, method acting and stuff, did you hear that Daniel Day-Lewis is quitting acting now? Again? I feel like that's something that happens a lot. (laughs) No, Daniel Day-Lewis has never quit before. I mean, he takes long breaks between movies, but he's released a statement that he's officially done. I think I did hear about that. How long ago was it? Just recently, this new movie of his that's coming out uh, is is supposedly going to be his final movie. 
Yeah, I think I did hear about that. Yeah, pretty interesting. I'm really I mean, curious about that new film. Uh, he's playing like a fashion designer, like a couture designer in the 50s. And, and this is going to be really pessimistic, which I don't really like bringing to the show. <laughs> but um, like, oh, I'm quitting acting. Also go see my last movie. Like, Yeah, well, I read this interview with him and it really didn't strike me that way. And Daniel Day-Lewis okay. himself just doesn't strike me that way. Like he, you know, he's a man who just really like, gives his all the movies like that's what he's famous for is just like really dedicating himself to a part he um for like the ballad of jack and rose he like learned how to construct a table from wood by hand and he like built a table to get into the character and um for this one he actually um like recreated a 50s couture gown from scratch like he just looked at it and and tried to make it <laughs> and like you know this is kind of for uh gangs of new york he learned how to throw knives accurately <laughs> so like this is like he's just that guy you know i mean he's famous for being that guy yeah. um but he's like i you know i throw myself into these roles and like i just sort of do these things because i am compelled to and i can't do anything do things any other way and now i feel this compulsion to be done so i mean that's really interesting but i i don't know it makes me think of hayao miyazaki who's always you know come out of retirement from <laughs> like for creative people like if you feel compelled to transform into a role how can you just stop you know there's always going to be one well, more i mean we'll sure and i think that happens a lot but this is the first time that daniel day lewis has quit <laughs> so maybe it will stick we have no reason to disbelieve him at this point i guess that's true um but yeah I mean, he's 60 years old. Like, he's like, I'm done. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do next, but probably not movies. So, mm. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, fascinating dude. I don't, like, I I didn't even realize, I don't know why, but I didn't even realize he's British. <laughs> like, well, he his does, roles are right, exactly. so American. Yeah, exactly. Like, vi- with with a few exceptions, he pretty much only plays American roles in, in American movies. And, in fact, like, really like iconically american parts like um lincoln lincoln (laughs) (laughs) and you know he was hawkeye in last of the mohicans and he uh you know bill the butcher in gangs of new york like really just very american stuff Mm -hmm. um but this the final role is a british man so very interesting well We've stalled for a while. Do you want <laughs> yeah, to talk started. about The Good Place? Sure. Yeah. So, yeah, we're going to talk about The Good Place. Um, we almost talked about it last time, but then we were like, no, we're prepared for this other thing. Let's just talk about The Good Place next time. Yeah. Um, now, Alex, have you watched any of season two? Yes, I have. I've seen most of it. I don't know if the, oh, an episode came out this or last week, but up until, I've yeah, mm. I think episode seven I've seen, something like that. Okay, well, I haven't watched any of it, but (laughs) in the spirit of fairness about this podcast, don't worry about spoiling me. I don't mind. Talk about season two all you want. Okay. Um, Well, we always do a blanket spoiler warning at the beginning of each episode, but, like, this is, I really want to... Super duper spoiler Super duper spoiler alert for season one of The Good Place. This is going to either ruin it for you or you're going to catch it, like, ten minutes into the show and you're not going to care at all. So, <laughs> yeah, it's like season one ends with the biggest twist. So, like, we're talking about yes. it. Yes, <laughs> and it it I was one of those people that was like, at the exact same time the character realized it, I realized it. I was like, oh my god. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Because I I want to talk about. It, so let's just say what it is. Like, turns out the good place is not the good place. It's the bad place. They have been. You know, it's it's not heaven, it's hell, and they've been being tortured all along. They just didn't know it, and that's what made it hell. Um, and I just, I'm fascinated by that because, you know, as I, I actually went back, um, Dylan, my brother, was uh, decided to check it out. So he was watching it from the beginning, and so I was just watching a little bit along mm-hmm. with him, rewatching it. And, like, I was thinking about how um, 
better it is, <laughs> yeah. like, knowing that it's the bad place. Because, like, some stuff, it's, like, it's the kind of stuff that's easy to just sort of laugh off, and then maybe later someone will write a think piece like, hey, this doesn't really seem like the good place. Oh, fan theory, what if it's not? <laughs> and then, like, it isn't. So, like, like just, you know, little thing where, you know, things are just all going wrong, and, like, people aren't actually happy, and, like, so the good- you don't think the good about, thing about it because it's a tv is show it, at least the first couple episodes goes into the construction of the good place um oh, so does it? He, he like goes through different versions of it both uh as sort of like building it before they get there and also like different versions of it as they continually figure it out each time um okay but like i would in, you know regarding you know the little things you catch is like uh, every place to eat in the good place is a froyo place Everything is frozen yogurt. And, and they describe it in se- season two, I think they're like, what would be the most, like, disappointing place you could go, and it would be the only one you could go to? It's like frozen yogurt, because it's not quite as good as ice cream, but it's still not like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I saw, I was kind of reading up on some stuff earlier today, and I saw this funny line from season two where... Michael's like, Janet, what's a food that humans yeah, think the that they part, like, yeah. but they really don't? <laughs> and she says frozen yogurt. And he's like, perfect, yep. yes! <laughs> that's what I was talking about, exactly. And that's, I mean, that's really the epitome, because it's, they're they're being tortured and they don't even know it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, they think that they're in paradise, but it just kind of sucks. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's like, again, in season two, they go into, into Michael like, at the bad place, sort of coming up with this idea and trying to pitch it. He's like, what if we Mm -hmm. make them think it's the bad place? And they're like, no, 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 you can't do this. But he steals Janet, because she's a good place Janet. He steals her Mm -hmm. and, like, to (laughs) sow the deception. Yeah. I love bad place Janet, though. uh, (laughs) She cracks me up. (laughs) But, no, I just, I find it super fascinating that, like, this, it's, you know, primetime network comedy show, but it really cares to get into, like, the actual intellectual philosophical conversation. Like, it's not just some sort of cursory, like, you know, hand-waving concepts about philosophy. Like, they get into it for real. Yeah, but at the same and... time, they're being completely, oh, God, I just had the word on tip of my mouth, um non-religious completely non-religious oh yeah it's super secular exactly, like at, for an afterlife story it's totally right? secular like talking and talking <laughs> about morality while being completely secular as well on prime time you know oh it's so smart yeah. <laughs> i feel like it'll be really yeah, hard to do you know i think so well i mean and you know they're just calling up you know drawing upon secular philosophers yeah mm-hmm which there are plenty of. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, you know, okay. One thing that occurred to me towards the end of season one and then more and more as I sort of rewatched the beginning of season one mm-hmm. was how subtly queer it is. Because, um, <laughs> like, it just, it, okay, gonna say it right now. I ship... Eleanor and Tahani forever. <laughs> um, because she, I don't know if she's, uh, if she ever says she's bi, but she's basically bi. Yeah, well, and that's what I didn't really notice before. It's, it's, this thing has occurred to me recently, and I, it's the weirdest thing. As much as I want everything to be gay, I have a huge blind spot for gay stuff in mainstream media because I don't expect it to be uh-huh, there. Mm-hmm. Um, so, like, end of season one... Um, Eleanor's like, uh, you know, sort of spelling everything out and describing each of the people and the way that she's describing Tahani, she's just like being super complimentary, especially about Tahani's physical appearance. And then she's like, whoa, maybe my soulmate's Tahani. (laughs) Gonna table that for now. Like, (laughs) like, and like uh, going back and rewatching, I'm like, dang, these two really are crushing on each other. Like. Eleanor, even when Eleanor thinks she hates Tahani, she can't <laughs> stop complimenting each other, co- complimenting her, especially, like, her physical appearance. Like, she thinks Tahani is super hot. Well, and I think, I think and it's like, partially that she's queer-coded, but also, like, mm-hmm. 
she's ex- Tani's exactly what she would have wanted herself to be in in living. <laughs> Well, she is. She's super jealous yeah. of her. But, like, and then Tahani's just very fond of Eleanor. She's always very touchy with her and, like, just really wants to be close with her all the time. And it's like, you two need to go and be lesbians, please. Well, then I think please. Also, in the first one or two episodes, there's, like, that, that those two guys that they hate because they're so cute. Yeah. Yeah. Those two are totally dude soulmates. But then they don't like, they're definitely. They show up again. <laughs> they, they show up. Yeah, briefly yeah. sort of separate from each other they're just sort of background yeah. characters after that scene about them like cleaning up all the mess well um but they're yeah, around in season two some of the background characters become a little get a couple more lines um because they're revealed to be demons along with michael i mean they're not technically yeah it, it kind of like, loses some weight when yeah. you f- find out they're not really soulmates they're just demon actors playing yeah. a part <laughs> but they are there and they're pretty definitely implied to be gay Mm -hmm. um but yeah just like all of the sort of um partner swapping going on (laughs) really cracks me up um but i like as soon as eleanor said that bit about maybe tahani is her soulmate i was like ding (laughs) what oh my god (laughs) it's clicked for me that's all i want now (laughs) it's all i want it's so, uh, I you know, I really love Tahani a lot. Like, she's probably my favorite character. I f- just find her so endearing. I like, oh, I like them all. I they're know. very different, too, which is nice. It's really impossible to choose. I said they're hmm? really different, too, which is really nice. Yeah, they're all really different, but they're equally likable, which and is crazy. And equally horrible people. <laughs> they, yeah. Well, I she, mean, I don't know. Really like... <laughs> Yeah, that's the one I was going to say, because it's like, you know, he's, but he sort of epitomizes the um, dilemma of, like, uh, you know, the whole thing about, like, true evil being a good man's yeah. inaction. Mm-hmm. Like, he, you know, he didn't ever do anything, and that's worse than doing something bad, maybe? Yeah. I don't, I mean, that's one of those sort of philosophical quandaries. Mm-hmm. Um which is just another really smart thing about the show. Oh, they do show. so much research that, I mean, obviously, I mean, I take it for granted. I know I do. Like, it's it's fun to hear, and it's funny the way they present it. But, like, I'm sure they need to know their shit. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I mean, if they're going to convincingly write a moral philosopher as a character. And, and like, they have seem him teach be. moral philosophy as, like, a high school course. Yeah. <laughs> Oh man, I love that stuff with Jason when he's first like attending cheaty school, <laughs> and he's like, like three questions: uh, when's football tryouts? Does this school have a prom? <laughs> There's like, oh no. So something to look yeah, forward to for season two. Uh, Michael starts attending. I heard. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah. Well, because like I don't know they. They, they, they all sort of have to, they end up on the same side because he doesn't want to get in trouble for um, resetting their their neighborhood. Right, yeah. So he's like, um, he's and ha- they, has to have a they, charade They make as a well. deal, they're like, we're not going to, we're, we're going to so- sort of pretend that we're being tortured so that you don't get in trouble, but you have to like to- not torture us. <laughs> I like that. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I gotta, I gotta get my butt in gear and watch these. I just don't actually watch anything on real TV, so like I blaze. I, mean, I just, I, my parents have uh, Comcast, uh-huh. and because if you have an, a, Com- a Comcast account, you can log in and watch it online. Yeah, I'm on CenturyLink. Wah, wah. Wah. Yeah, so <laughs> I, uh, I gotta find some way to watch season two i just i mean i'm sure it'll, it'll it'll show up on netflix eventually i mean that's where the, yeah but it probably is a... for anybody that's this far and hasn't <laughs> <laughs> yeah what are you doing here but yeah i just I, I mean season one went up coinciding with like the airing of season two so yeah. probably season two won't go up until season three airs yeah. wah <laughs> but okay another thing uh that just strikes me is how unlikable of a character eleanor would be if she were played by anyone except Kristen bell oh 100 percent. Kristen bell is she's the she's cutest sort of... sweetest and most darling cherub oh, i <laughs> she's so cute and this is such a great character for her that we haven't seen her really in before i know she's always like little bubbly like 
cutie pies. I mean, I've I've seen her play a villain before, but it was like a lovable villain because you're like, she's so badass. I love everything about her. What was that in? Uh, and I think it was season two of Heroes. She had oh. electricity powers. I didn't watch that much of Heroes. <laughs> <laughs> season two was actually pretty good. Uh, after that, not so much. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, I I was sort of looking up some stuff about the show, and I didn't realize um, the showrunner and creator of the series also created Parks and Recreation. Um, of course. Brooklyn Nine Nine. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. And worked on The Office. And what was the last one? Sorry. The Office. He worked on it. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and like it's a really fascinating progression, and I can totally see sort of the development of his ideas and values. His uh, his name is sorry, uh, Michael Schur. Mm-hmm. And like just seeing sort of that progression of from The Office to Parks and Rec to Brooklyn Nine Nine to The Good Place. Well, like because The Good Place is sort of its own workplace comedy. Especially there's a lot of scenes in Michael's office. There's yeah. a lot of scenes with them like trying to figure out what's going. You know. So yeah, it's, it totally he's sort of fits. like, but he's still sort of expanding upon those oh, kinds of completely. ideas. This he's like, such a, like, yeah. And I, I love how like intentionally censored it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What the shirt? <laughs> yeah. Fork me. <laughs> You're such a bench. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's. It's so cute, and it's so, and that's, I mean, like, just especially, because, I mean, on our Brooklyn Nine-Nine episode, like, we were talking about, like, I love the way that this is written, I like sort of the ideas behind it, it's just the setting makes me uncomfortable, and so this is great, this is basically what we asked for, like, okay, it's this great, (laughs) fun thing about funny, lovable, different types of characters coming together but it's set in the afterlife. And <laughs> so it's totally, you know, palatable. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, I w- I'm curious what um our friend Brent Raptor has to say about The Good Place. <laughs> right? Well, I, I think uh, they mentioned it in that episode, too. Oh, did they? I don't, I think, I don't even I think remember. they were like, I have so much to say about it, and you should watch it. And I think that's why I watched it. <laughs> oh, man. I guess, yeah, I, like, I, it was so far on the edge of my periphery at that point that, like, if it was mentioned, I, like, totally missed it. I just totally <laughs> forgot. Um, yeah, no, I, I know that they do uh, enjoy the show, but, um, yeah, it, I mean, who wouldn't? It's lovely. It's just lovely. <laughs> and total side, not, not, no, we're not really a side note, um, I don't really keep up with Brooklyn Nine-Nine, but I guess that one of the main characters just came out. Really? Oh, yes. Um, I don't know their names. Oh, no. Dark, long, curly hair. Sassy. Oh, Rosa? Rosa? Rosa just came out as bi. Oh, cool. On the newest episode. I've seen gifts all over the world. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure it's being gift up a storm. That's Tumblr's favorite thing. <laughs> well, I, I, I mean, Twitter, I think, too, because that's where I originally saw it, and then all over Tumblr. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's cool. That's cool. I mean, that's again, like again, that that I mean, sort of off talking about Brooklyn Nine Nine again. But like, <laughs> that's that was never really the show's problem, though. Like, that's yeah. cool. But like, we've we spoke about yeah, that we, yeah. ad nauseum. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. the, you know, they're great at the sort of diverse, well represented, fun, interesting characters. Uh, it's just some other stuff that's a problem. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so they should all just die and then go to the good place. Go to the good slash bad place, <laughs> and then we would have the show that we want. That's the solution. Yes, we found it. Oh my god, that's <laughs> in the, in the show notes. You should just say, "Also, we solved Brooklyn Nine Nine." <laughs> <laughs> I will. <laughs> oh boy, well. I mean, since they're Dude. created by the same person, they could totally do it. Just cross them right over. Yeah, just, oh, we're just... done with enough seasons here, so they all die in a... Oh, well, yeah, aren't they sad, even but... on the same network? Yeah, I think so, NBC. Oh, no. Yeah. Brooklyn Nine-Nine might be on Where's Fox. Brooklyn... Oh, it might be. You're right. <laughs> Bummer. <laughs> 
Speaking of, uh, of Fox, didn't Disney just buy yeah. them? I wouldn't be shocked. Honestly, I'd be shocked if they didn't already own them. I think they either just bought 21st <laughs> Century Fox. Or I don't they, know. Or they just bought uh, X-Men and Spider-Man back from them. Either just X-Men and Spider-Man back from them or all of them. Okay. Yeah, I'm huh. totally just looking it up right now because uh, it was big news today or yesterday. Yeah, that is, that is big news. I didn't hear it. Back to uh, back to the good place, though. I mean, because I was saying earlier, sort of, I can see the progression from show to show, what Michael Schur has sort of been going for. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I feel like sort of his values are really reflecting, like, the world that we're in at the time that the show is airing. Mm-hmm. So with, like, you know, the with parks and recreation you know that was sort of a, it, that was a very obama administration yes. kind of a show mm-hmm. whereas the good place is very much a show for the trump timeline uh <laughs> you know just these sort of you know sort of what is morally acceptable is something that is a, a strangely a really relevant conversation politically and how do we talk about right it with each now other and how do we teach each other yeah and just like what e- what even is it like what do you get like you know we have to actually have these conversations now about like what is moral what is acceptable like how do we even decide that and <laughs> so like it's it's pretty well and and i think that um because there was like a little season break um in the middle of season one and i'm pretty sure that the the last part of season one sort of aired right before trump's inauguration Mm -hmm. and it was just very timely yeah this this discussion of like what what it is to be a good person and whether it matters (laughs) <laughs> and and it's, can you it's really can you sort of change that can you work on it yes that's that's the really interesting thing about eleanor as a character because she broke michael's plan because she is so genuine she's the only one who was able to figure it out because everyone else is sort of living their lives or after lives in a way that sort of like they're being themselves they're, they're not truthful or, with yeah. them yeah. but they're not, not truthful yeah. with themselves and she's oh, yeah. truthful she's like, oh, with I'm, herself I'm horrible you know especially now after <laughs> she yeah she acknowledges who she is and what she's done you know she maybe had some denial about herself in her life but now that she's dead she's got no illusions about who she's been and what she needs to be in order to be worthy of something that ultimately was a fake (laughs) carrot but like you know she she figured it out because she's not Mm -hmm. hiding except she is but she isn't Mm -hmm. she's not hiding from herself well which makes her so funny because she's so uh, again the character is so lovably awful she sucks i love it (laughs) she really sucks they do just such a good job of selling it like i could never have thought that Kristen bell could pull off just being the worst but she just is <laughs> <laughs> and yet and yet i love her i love her still but yet like especially i mean jason's just too too dumb to eat and that's that's an interesting question because most of his immorality comes from just being dumb like yeah, he's ignorance. just not smart enough to be moral and that's a really interesting quandary well and then um, yeah exactly exactly like it it's sort of like the whole, um, I don't know, something, something about ignorance is like, ignorance, I mean, obviously ignorance is bliss is what we hear all the time, but like, can you be lifted up from there? And that's sort of the start of that for him. And can you be held accountable for ignorance? Like, yeah. you know, you can't, that's a big can, right can you be blamed? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because he's just too dumb. Like, he's <laughs> just very dumb. He doesn't know any better. Yeah. Um, you know, Chidi, he's sort of blind to his own 
fault because of his sort of intellectualism. Yeah. And then Tahani is just sort of selfishly philanthropic. <laughs> They've all got these really fascinating, distinct flaws. It's really incredible. I love her, like, talking about her own accomplishments when she's like, oh, I've met so, you know, it's so enticing. Yeah, it's, it's so talking enticing. about, it's oh, like, her, my, my godmother, Diana. Yeah. It doesn't matter where she was princess of, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I love her. You know, that kind of character always gets me because, like, Lucille is my favorite character on Arrested Development. Like, just those very, oh, yeah. like, snooty sort of women. I just <laughs> love them. I love them. They're too well, funny. it's so that, interesting, too, just, because, like, when you first start the show, you think Eleanor is the main character and you don't know how fleeting the other characters are going to be. Um, I thought that... But but Tahani's almost set up as, like, a an antagonist, like, well, a rival. I was like, okay, is she just, like, the episode antagonist? Or, like, you know? Um, and I was like... Yeah. I, I, I don't know, maybe sort of, like, an internal thought, like, oh, I'm gonna get so tired of this character. But no. <laughs> Not at all. No, she's lovely. Yeah, just the comedy that comes out of extreme privilege is just my favorite. Well, and she's so, like, <laughs> sickeningly sweet, too. And condescending. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I know. she's talking about Eleanor's precious. It's like a house for a little dog. <laughs> you know, it's like, what a thing to say. But I mean, but that's the thing about her is like she just she's just so privileged that she doesn't even get it. Like similar to Jason, like she's unkind but she doesn't even really realize that she's being unkind yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> it's really funny <laughs> <laughs> whereas with eleanor she just like doesn't care that she's unkind she thinks that the best way to be is to be unkind in her life yeah. you know she she recognizes that she's being crappy but she just feels like it doesn't matter or is the best thing for mm -hmm. her you know there's that whole thing uh the flashbacks to like her boyfriend saying oh we shouldn't go to that coffee shop anymore and eleanor being like what you think you're better than me like it doesn't matter <laughs> so. i like the one I, I hope it's in season one um where she, she's out of the bar with her friends and it's her turn to pay yeah and she just and she keeps, keeps getting a, it. <laughs> no it's she's supposed to be the designated driver oh right 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 <laughs> yeah and she just keeps finding ways to get out of it so that she gets to drink yeah <laughs> Yeah, she just, like, she knows. Yeah, like, with um with Chidi and Tahani, you know, they were sort of unaware of their badness. Well, yeah, and they, they totally, that totally plays into the audience's, um you know, unawareness of... Yeah, uh, to, really to believe this lie. Yeah. Uh, but Eleanor, I don't think, ever had any illusions. I mean, like, maybe the the extremity of her badness. She was like, oh, whatever. Like, it's normal. She could sort of write off her bad behavior, yeah. but mm -hmm. she didn't think that it wasn't bad behavior. Yeah. She just didn't really care. Mm -hmm. So, so and, and that sort of, you know, goes into the idea of her being the one without illusions, and that's why ultimately they couldn't trick her yeah oh, yeah i, 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 I smile every time i i just want to rewatch that scene over and over again where she figures it out <laughs> it's so good and just just all of that like those last few episodes with them like trying to decide who has to go to the bad place and stuff like it's just such a mess and it's so I love, funny i love the medium place yeah <laughs> Yes, what is that woman's name? I can't remember. I don't remember the character's name, but, but I know the actress, she's from um, Workaholics. Oh, is she? I've watched a little Workaholics. She's the boss but not in very Workaholics. Much. Okay, okay. Yeah, I didn't realize. She plays this, well, not the same character, but she's very severe. <laughs> yeah. All, yeah, that'd be She's completely, 100% as a character, driven by cocaine. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, but, oh, um, another, I, so I, yeah, I was sort of reading around about, you know, to get some ideas about what I wanted to talk about today, and um, I read this really interesting article, um, it was sort of a perspective that I hadn't uh, seen anywhere else, the idea of sort of the good place um, being built upon our 
misplaced trust in technology um mm. because this whole the whole sort of concept of it is you know an algorithm it's like you know your numbers and how they add up and how you know what counts for what and just sort of this blind trust where you're just like oh okay it's an algorithm it's uh, we, it's beyond me like okay fine like that it, that's how that's what it is okay and nobody questions it um, and then, you know, sort of the good place itself runs like a like a computer simulation with like mm -hmm. glitches and you know, you've got Janet who's basically Siri and like <laughs> um you know, the screens that pop up, you know, Tahani like reading the rankings and all of that stuff. It's all very technological and it, people are just sort of complacent with it because we just sort of automatically assume that it can be trusted. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I, I thought it was a really interesting way of it just it hadn't occurred to me. But it's like, yeah, they just blindly accept that this algorithm is right. And like, what is I like, how does it how I don't know. I mean, to, to a point, you do have to sort of get into the like theological side of it. It's like, OK, clearly there's some sort of higher power that's running this whole system well, yeah. mm -hmm. but but is it but is it mathematics that's running it is it you know some sort of yeah scientific but then that sort of goes against what i feel like is really bringing a wider audience and that's you know not necessarily putting a label on this afterlife yeah well and they do address it you know in the first episode saying like well you know each religion got a little bit of it right and so yeah. it's sort of it's, you know, it, it ultimately is a spiritual concept, but it's sort of a religious. Yeah. Mm hmm I mean, we don't really get into it. I mean, I wonder. I wonder if the show ever really will get into sort of more of the truths of the universe, you know? Um, like In season two, they deal a little bit more with, like, what will happen to Michael if he's put, like, in trouble. If he messes uh -huh. up, it's like, he describes it as this, like, endlessly painful being torn apart. Like, you know, it's very, um... Yeah, well, I mean, we did cosmic. get a little bit of that. Yeah, it's all very cosmic. Uh, on, uh, it was ultimately, like, false, but, like, his retirement in season one was gonna be, like, endless torture, yeah. and... So, like, there is some of that, but, like, I'm curious, I mean, as this it sort of starts acknowledging the hierarchies and the bureaucracy behind the place that Michael comes from, like, what is it ultimately going to land on being, like, who runs it all and where it all comes from? Well, so far, it's very bureaucratic. Um, mm -hmm. They show it, they show the bad place as they're all tinkering away, and it's very much like a bank. <laughs> yeah no we and we again we saw some oh, of that okay. in season I, yeah, one I, it all sort of blurred together for me i binged a lot <laughs> yeah yeah i mean we we see it before we realize that this is like a bad place office yeah. oh, right, um right, right, right. when he's like got the idea for oh, yeah. his version yeah. of the good mm -hmm. place and he's he becomes an architect for oh, the first yeah. time mm -hmm. but i don't know i mean there's definitely sort of a uh clearly intentional but fairly noticeable gap in what we are told about how everything is run yeah and i think hopefully that they're saving i mean obviously they're saving stuff so they don't run out of material to make a show you know mm -hmm. because they could i'm curious if they'll even address it though know. because you know they're keeping it so secular i i, I think they're I trying know. to be very scientific um and also or at least just sort of like vaguely mystical. Yeah, <laughs> vaguely mystical, cosmic, unknown, um, all of that. Yeah. Yeah, it's there. There's a lot unaddressed. Well, but I we'll think see. in terms of, of going back to like how queer it is. Um, yeah. It reminds me a lot of stuff that uh, Brett's Brent Brett. I, I'm so bad with names. Brett. Oh, okay. Brett Raptor. They post a lot on their Twitter about um, having multiple names for themselves and also either no yeah. gender or no uh, pronouns or no, no pronouns. Name even, yeah, they're uh, they're recently <laughs> they're trying to decide a lot of well, stuff and it makes lately. Me think, and I, this is probably why they love the show 
and mentioned it, I think, in that episode was uh, Janet constantly reminding people, I'm not a woman. I'm not a person. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a girl. Like, yeah, when, when Jason, like, calls her, like, a girl, he, she's yeah. like, and I then, am not a girl. Like, constantly, <laughs> it's like, I'm not a person. <laughs> Yeah. So I don't know. I think that's really. I I mean, it's it's for humor's sake in the show, but it's also kind of like, you know, there's an entity that is very similar to us, in a lot of ways, acts like us, but. Uh huh. And is yeah has this particular uh, circumstance, and it is just yeah. fine <laughs> and it's probably i think i think i think janet is my favorite character <laughs> i think i just decided just now <laughs> she... yeah janet's pretty great just oh janet is so funny i was watching um yeah uh outtakes earlier today from the first season oh um, yeah and she's just she's just i don't know the set seems so much fun Although, although I don't oh, yeah? know, the one the one thing that I, I probably wouldn't ever want to be on the show is because uh, in multiple scenes, um, Kristen Bell is burping in people's faces. <laughs> oh, Kristen. But I'm, I'm sure that passes as fine in her household, knowing her husband, so. <laughs> oh, yeah, her and Dax. <laughs> sure, that's how they say good morning. <laughs> Uh, was I'm trying to, was there something else a different thing besides the good place you wanted to talk uh, about? Oh, did we want to talk a little bit about my recommendation and or not for King Arthur? <laughs> yeah, I want tell me about King Arthur. We got a little time. Let's hear about that. Okay. So, it's a movie. <laughs> it <it's>, is. <laughs> it's direct it's it's directed by Guy Ritchie and that is um too obvious and too apparent in it. It's well, too, it was in the trailers. It's it's way too Guy Ritchie. It's way too much. <laughs> Maximum like, Guy. No, like overload. Like <laughs> Sherlock Holmes was maximum, and it was tasteful. This was overload, and it was disgusting. It just didn't look good. The editing was atrocious. Oh my um... gosh, the the art design was great. The, okay. cre- the creatures were kind of cool, although they did have giant elephants, and I was like, really? <laughs> of all things. <laughs> um, the acting was not great. You know, Charlie Hunnam has no screen presence of any kind. Like, he just, he's like a non-entity. He does. <laughs> well, and it didn't, it really did not help that. No character had any development of any kind at all. <laughs> None of them. There was a huge cast. And, like, some of them you're like, oh, my gosh, starting to be really interesting. But then it's like, no. Just, like, cuts away, goes to a million other characters. And you're just like, Ugh. Yeah. It, it was exhausting to watch, honestly. It looked pretty frenetic. It's, I would say it's frantic. It's just, like, <laughs> trying to catch its breath the whole movie. And, like, there's some there are some neat things, like... Uh, Jude Law's character gets his power from these like sea witches. Okay. Um, they're like they're like selkies, I think is what, or they're like um women body women tops with octopus bottoms. Oh, weird. So like Ursula, like yeah. Ursula. I don't know what that um, is. One of them, one of them is very Ursula inspired. <laughs> um, and they're kind of cool. I thought they were cool. Um, but that was about it. Hmm. Yeah, it looked like something to miss for sure if you want to watch a bad movie watch it but (laughs) um you may have you maybe you will be easily distracted and it will be difficult to pay attention because it's so all over the place yeah i mean i'm into like cruddy like genre films but that one just looks a little too cruddy for that reason really i don't know it is a little too cruddy it's like Um, i would okay so So, um, we always talk about, um, uh, movies with Mikey. We do. Because we're obsessed. Um, but I think his channel has another sort of other show besides movies with Mikey. I forget what it's called, but they sit down him and some friends and they watch a movie that's been, uh, perceived as bad. So one of the more recent ones they watched, um, 
uh, League of Extraordinary Gen- Gentlemen, and they absolutely loved it. Really? They did? Because I don't. Yes. <laughs> watch, watch them watching it, and I, you might change I want to. No, that sounds really fascinating, <laughs> because it is one that I've just completely abhorred. Yeah. So, like, I want to hear what they have to say. Excellent, this would be an excellent candidate for them. It sounds like it. It's... Because there's some, like, I mean, it's, it's just so much going on <laughs> that there's something, there's got to be something, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> did you see... It's a movie. <laughs> did you see the Warcraft movie? No. I wanted to, kind of, though. It's... I would venture to say I expect it's better than King Arthur. Oh, I'm sure it's better than King Arthur. But it's not... It's honestly kind of boring. Like, that's sort of... It sounds like the biggest difference between the two, whereas King Arthur sounds like there's just too much. Like, it's just, like, overload. Warcraft is just like, I mean, part of it is just kind of like, here's this Warcraft place, and here's this Warcraft reference, and if you don't know Warcraft, yeah. you're just like, um, okay, I guess so. But it's really very, um, dull. <laughs> the oh, stuff, wow. Well, the stuff about the orcs is really, really good. The orc characters are really compelling, their story is really fascinating, the humans are super boring. <laughs> um, yeah, the the main character guy is played by um, Travis Fimmel, who I find very... He's like the interesting Charlie Hunnam. <laughs> 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 I just, they're, they're very similar looking dudes. Um, Charlie mm-hmm. Hunnam, of course, was on Sons of Anarchy, and uh, Travis Fimmel is um, Ragnar Lothbrok in Vikings. And I, like, got them confused for a long time, but then I realized (laughs) that Travis Fimmel is sort of an interesting man, and Charlie Hunnam is a block of wood. So, um, but yeah, I'm sensing some similarity, but except for that sort of distinction between the two films. Yeah, I think another way to describe King Arthur is, like, you know how um, if you took uh, a movie viewer from, like, the dawn of movies... And yeah. put them in the movies now, they would just like explode. explode. Yeah, <laughs> I feel like this is the beginning of that for me. Like it's it's just like so Too... much visual noise. Well, I, I mean, I don't it. think that I don't think that anyone was asking for King Arthur. I don't think that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I have I literally have another Blu-ray of another King Arthur movie that I am, I love way more than this, and it's a bad mm. movie too. What the the, the Clive, Clive Owen, Owen one? one? Oh, yeah, that's I a bad love, one too. But it's I love yeah. I, it. See, that's the kind of like cruddy genre movie that I like. Yeah, that, <laughs> it's just kind of boring, um, but it's neat. <laughs> <laughs> a bit forgettable, it's, but that's it's, okay. It's very moody. I like the mood of it. Oh. Yeah. Oh, speaking of that, one that strikes me as very similar, but is way more forgettable, is the um. Russell Crowe Robin Hood movie? Oh, I I feel like... You forgot it even existed, right? No, I knew it existed and I never watched it, but I, I, I just remember it being... Isn't it directed by the same guy and also starring Russell Crowe, Noah's Ark? No, it's not a Darren Aronofsky movie. Oh, okay. I'm, I get... I, there's something... I have, I have to Google it real quick because there was something about that that's like weirdly connected. Okay. Uh, Robin Hood. Is it just called Robin Hood? Yeah, it's just called Robin Hood. You can't beat Men in Tights. I'm, I'm serious. Like, it's the best Robin Hood movie. It is. And I don't know. I feel like it's more accurate too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Where Ridley Scott. Oh my God, that's who. It yeah, was. it was Ridley Scott. That's who it was. Why? Stick to the future. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean Ridley Scott's made some good movies, but that well, one was cool just would, a snooze. How cool would a futuristic Robin Hood be? Why not? Sounds great. Let's mix it up. It, it was just so the cool. most dour, boring version of the Middle Ages I've ever seen. Everything was muddy and brown, and everyone was grimacing, and I didn't care. <laughs> right? Like, I, there are so few good movies about knights. There really are. I mean, I'm trying to think. I like, like That's like my favorite genre, too, especially as a kid. Yeah. Like, okay, my favorite medieval knights movie 
Um, if we're talking like, it, and, 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 you know, to, to sort of stay away from the realm of the high fantasy, you know, excluding Lord of the Rings and what have you. Um, I think probably Lady Hawk. Oh, that's one of uh, Mikey's favorites, but I, I haven't seen it. Yes, he did do a movies with Mikey about Lady Hawk, and I <laughs> love Lady Hawk. It's a fairy tale, and it's wonderful. It's got Rutger Hauer. One that I always loved, and it is fantasy, yeah. was Dragonheart. Okay, yeah. And, you know, I mostly just want to exclude Lord of the Rings because you have to exclude Lord yeah, of the Rings. Yeah, I mean, none of the other that's fantasy like, that's... movies are Academy Award winners. Yeah, like, that's the good one. <laughs> what else is there? So, <laughs> you can't well, have a just, conversation if just, you're including it, yeah, Lord of the Rings. Yeah, it's just a completely different level. Um, and none of them are bad. Well, none of the original trilogy are bad. We already talked about The Hobbit. We don't have to talk about it again. <laughs> yeah, we don't need to get into that again. <laughs> Uh, yeah, there are though so few good movies about knights. Did you see that one? I think it was like a directed video. Um, what was it called? Like the Black Plague or something? Sean Bean was it? No. no yeah, it was weird. It. it was like about these knights going to like this village because they think that like maybe that's where the plague came from, and then there's a witch there, but maybe she's not a hmm. witch. <gasps> oh! 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 That's like yeah. eight other movies. <laughs> I do yeah. remember that though. I, I watched I it on Netflix, I think. It's weird. I don't know if it was called Black Plague. I don't know. And then there was that one with the witch and it's that redheaded lady from Golden Circle. Um I'm so bad with that. I don't I, I don't, I I don't know which one you're always. talking about, but there was that terrible looking Julianne Moore. Oh. Uh, she plays a witch who turns into a dragon. What? Season of the Witch or something? Well, Season of the Witch was the one with uh, Nicolas Cage. Yes, I think that was it. I don't think she Maybe. was in that one. I think it was somebody else playing there's the witch. Too, again, there's there's too many. And that's a genre that I love, too, because there's they're always bad. Witch it's movies, like, yeah. Witch movies. And they're like, they're always like vaguely like. Um, Misogynistic. <laughs> well, that, obviously that, but also like not. They're, they're really not like. Um, Salem version of the witches they're always like oh yeah the like medieval witch they're, well they're always like medieval but then always with like some sort of um Asian inspired flair like turning into a giant dragon well I mean I don't know that's, that's I mean that's like classic fairy tale stuff that's Maleficent yeah but I, I don't know I'm just thinking of the costuming they're always like well, the, yeah like I, Indonesian inspired I costumes definitely and it's just like, can see that I mean sort of that orientalism like magic comes from Asia thing <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. In order to, you know, exotify them a little bit, just throw in some slightly Asian flair and call it good. Yeah, I can see yeah. that. Um, there was... And then, of course, there was uh, The Last Witch Hunter, which I actually liked a lot, too. Oh, that was um, Vin Diesel, right? Yep. Yeah, that was based on his Dungeons & Dragons character. <laughs> I know it's so good, and, and I, I loved it. I loved it so much. I, you know, I didn't, I didn't see it. Um, oh crud! What was the one? Was it based on a YA book about the kid who like goes and like becomes a, a witch hunter? He's got like a mentor dude who's played by oh. Jeff Bridges. Was it Jeff oh Bridges? My God. I've seen it. I don't yeah, it, right. But... What was it? Is that like, the one so, I'm thinking of? <laughs> he's like the seventh son? Is that what it is? Seventh son? That's not what it's called, but I think I know what one you're talking about. It's I is that the Julianne Moore one? Maybe that was the Julianne I'm Moore one. I'm looking up one. her movies and they're not in order and it's really annoying. Oh, oh no. Okay, let's see. Let's see. Why are you not in chronological order? Oh my gosh, I totally and then forgot of course... she's in the second lost in the second Jurassic Park movie. I oh, yeah, her. she is. She is. Oh, it was the Seventh Son. You're right. Seventh Son. Yes, that was a weird one. Yes, that it was I kinda, so weird. That's one of those movies where Jeff Bridges plays a cartoon character. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, he's got this weirdo voice. Uh, like, I, I think probably my favorite part of that whole movie was when... Uh, like, he's, like, showing the kid, like, all of his magic witch huntery things all of his weapons and doodads and stuff and then um he's got this like flask and he takes a drink of it and he says you must only ever take one sip of this per day and the kid says oh why and he says 
because it is mine. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, I just love that so much. That little switcher okay. there. But, the whole cast of that movie is so good that it's it shouldn't be bad. It's insane that it's ben, not Ben a good Barnes movie. is the main character. I mean, you you yes. could you could give or take him. Um, Jeff yeah. Bridges, Julianne Moore, Kit Harrington, Alicia Vikander. What? That was Kit Harrington. Yeah. I didn't even know. <laughs> so like, what a movie. What a, oh, it's a French movie. That's why. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know, that, that's where the initial be. release was, was France. So I think it was like... That's funny. Okay. It's a <laughs> book adaptation? I don't know. We've gone so off track, but I... Yeah, I thought it was. Okay, we need to have an episode. Our next right. episode should just be us, like, writing down some of our favorite movies from our movie collections and just, like, talking about them. Yeah, let's just talk about some nonsense. We've done 20 episodes with something of a point. Let's just do another episode without any point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and... Uh, they definitely episodes. changed the title um, with good reason uh, because the original book was The Spook's Apprentice, which is a very. Uh, oh, no, yeah, no, that's no, a very no, British, no, 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 can't very call British, it that. Um, only okay there. Yeah, it doesn't <laughs> come across correctly no, here, no, does it? No, no, no. 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 <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> anyway. <laughs> Do we do we have recommendations this week? <laughs> um. Well, I did mention um the marvelous Mrs. Meisel. Yes. But a um a very different sort of thing uh that I want to recommend is I am right now totally obsessed with the Lemon Demon album Spirit Phone. Oh, interesting. Do you know Lemon Demon? The name it's, sounds, uh, Neil Ciceriga. The ne- name sounds very familiar, but I don't know any of the music. Do you know Do you know Neil Ciceriga? No. He you do. Okay. Um, he <laughs> he made Potter Puppet Pals. Oh, okay, yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, the like mouth sounds and mouth silence albums, which are both very and mouth moods as well. They're all very good. The mouth albums. Um, he did um, Brody Quest. If anyone out there knows Brody Quest. Um, Ultimate Showdown of Ultimate Destiny. Lemon Demon is the name that he records music under. Okay. And uh, it's so good. It's a really bizarre album. It came out, I think, last year, but I've just been listening to it like crazy lately. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like a, it's like weird, you know, internet pop synth stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but this album sort of has like a spooky theme. It's called Spirit Phone. And... The subjects of the songs vary quite wildly from, uh, you know, bringing dead celebrities back to life to be famous some more to um, little mongoose ghosts to your dad (laughs) to (laughs) ant mills. And it's just a it's a very, very good album if you're into that kind of thing. And boy, am I into that kind of thing. Sometimes, kind of, just by the way you're describing it, reminds me a little bit of Ryan Gosling's band that he had that one album with. I didn't even know that that was. You a need thing. to look it up. It's exclusively a Halloween album. <laughs> it's like all about werewolves and vampires. It's so good. It's so like I need to look that up. Creepy, eerie definitely. with like a children's choir. You're gonna love it. I am. Yeah, this this is definitely, I mean, it's got some sort of spooky themes in it, but it's definitely not like a, like, the music is all sort of fun, poppy. Okay, yeah, no, this, Ryan Gosling's is like, I don't know, your seventh grade self will absolutely love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds like my cup of tea. Yeah, there's this great uh, song on the album called Cabinet Man. It is about a man who turned himself into an arcade cabinet. Oh, nice. That's kind of cool. Yeah. It's great. It's probably the catchiest song on the whole album. <laughs> How about you? Any recommendations? Yeah, so of the five books I bought at Powell's on Friday, I've only finished one, and that's because it's the shortest one. Also because I I read the first poem and I was like, holy shit, holy shit, holy shit. Um, so it's <laughs> Adorable Monsters, A Book of Spells and Prayers by Brent Reichenberger. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, so it's just a chapbook of poems, but I immediately thought okay this is gonna sound really like bad i immediately thought of my own book because a lot of the poems are either really similar formally or um in theme um yeah, it 
doesn't sound bad. That just sounds like you sort of relate to it and where this person's coming. Yeah, from. completely related to it. Like I'll, I'll read a couple short little things. Like there's there's poems. There's also some pictures with some captions and also just some like uh, large font filling up the whole page. Just little quotes. Um, so one of them is sometimes mm. when you have no one to talk to you, you tell everyone everything. Am I being lonely too loudly? Oh dang! Yeah, <laughs> that's um, that real stuff, right? And then the the dedication is this is for you if you need it, which I think is really cute. Aww. Um, yeah. Um, so it's uh, adorable monsters, a book of spells and prayers by uh, Brent Reichenberger, published by Ghost City Press. Um, it's it's very small press. You can probably go to their website. I got it at Powell's because they do some sort of they do little small press stuff. Um, yeah, they're Powell's. Yeah. You could probably buy it online from Powell's. Yeah, you probably can. Um, I don't. I mean, I took the last copy, but. <laughs> <laughs> the one, last they, one on the get more. last one on the floor at least um but yeah I, that's what i recommend because it uh it felt like a twin to my work which was really cool and validating that's awesome yeah it sounds great also like there's a um what do they call it when somebody writes a little quote for a book and they put it in the book or on the book oh like the little sort of like recommendation blurb yeah, type yeah, things. Yeah, yeah, There's a word for it. Yeah, I don't I, know what that's called. I know on. what that is. Yeah. But um, I, yeah. <laughs> and Joey Camo has one for this. Well. <laughs> so he, he said, this is a damaged book from a dusty shelf, shelf wrapped in protective curses just like you are. Pure, beautiful, queer magic. So, I mean, Joey said it. Well, that's, that's a real endorsement. I also bought Joey's newest book too, so I'm really excited to read that. Malagash? Yeah, oh. that, I gotta read that. It was that. in the... The um, uh, YA section, which really tripped me up. <laughs> but I mean, I guess it's about a younger character. I guess. So. And we, yeah, we, I did, mean, we hey. did pawn one of his books off in a YA literature course. Yes, so. we did use that as a project <laughs> for our YA lit class. That's how we became friends. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Joey, for making us friends. Bring us together. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're delirious. We need to go. <laughs> yep. That does it for today's episode. Thanks for listening. Please subscribe to us on YouTube if you absolutely love us. And like this video if you only like us. You can also find us on iTunes, Google Play, and Anchor.fm. Please rate and subscribe so more nerds can find us. Check us out on Twitter at LitMeritPod for updates and news. And thanks to Jonathan Colton for the use of our theme song, Fraud, from his album, Artificial Heart. Until next time, remember, no, no guilty, guilty pleasures. pleasures. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, we're feeling punchy. <gasps>